أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونتوكل عليه سبحانه وتعالى ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه تسليما كثيرا For the past five or four, five, six weeks there have been some demonstrations and protests that have caused the lives of a number of the Shabab from that country, the so-called Islamic Republic of Iran. And it started off, the impetus behind it, the genesis was because there was some girl from Kurdish descent, Rahmatullah Aleha, who wasn't wearing hijab properly. And she was appearing also on social media in a way where she was celebrating not wearing hijab. And she was caught by the morality police, and she wound up dead. I'm not here to get into who killed her, how did she die. I don't know anything about that. My guess is just like yours. It has to be a proper investigation. That's not what I'm talking about here today. But what I'm talking about is two issues as it relates to that. That protest that started off in the so-called Islamic Republic of Iran is spilled over and it came to Europe and it came to America and a number of countries where Muslims were protesting. I saw myself with my own eyes. When I was in Birmingham, there was a big protest in Birmingham. In London, there was a massive protest. First point that came to my mind and it jumped out off of the pages to me was, how in the world can Muslims feel a responsibility to protest for a girl who lost her life because she wasn't wearing hijab, so she was murdered, according to them. She had a number of hits to her head, she went unconscious, and she died. So the people wanted to protest and make an amr ma'roof and a nahi and al munkar for someone who was killed unjustly. Now, I have to say clearly, if this lady and this girl was killed just because she wasn't wearing hijab and she didn't make istihlal of Wearing the, not wearing hijab. She was killed. That's ghulu. That's dhulm. That is mujawazatul had. No one should lose their life for something like that. Not in Al Islam. So I make that categorically clear. But my first question is for the Muslim community how and why would you get behind a protest like that and you don't protest that in the Islamic Republic of Iran, they're cursing the companions. And they make takfir of the companions. And they say that Aisha was a zaniya, baghiya. Wallahi, alladhi la ilaha ghayruhu. Not wearing the hijab, anybody here. If your wife, your daughter doesn't wear hijab, you and her are falling into a kabira from the kabair, if you allow that. You are dayuth that won't enter to the Jannah, as the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a kabir from the kabair. But cursing the companions is kufrun billah. It's takdeeb of the book of Allah. Because Allah is pleased with all of those companions. And the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, loved Aisha more than any other human being. Radhi Allah anha. So the question is, we have priorities mixed up. This is the nature of our community today. I'm going to go out and protest with a lady that was killed, but I won't do anything when people are cursing the companions of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sanawat khadda'at. The other thing is, I find it very deafening that the voice of the feminists of the world, the so-called progressives, who also made istighlal of the phoba, of these protests. They took advantage of it, and they're encouraging your daughters, my daughters, your community, they're encouraging us to go out and get behind these protests. 
for the hurri of the mar'a, because the hijab holds her back. The hijab is takhalluf, is backwards, is barbaric. It's a sign of a man having pressure over a woman. If she wants to wear it, she should be allowed to wear it. If she doesn't want to wear it, she shouldn't be allowed to wear it. So they came out and they're supporting this, and they got a lot of traction because the feminists of the West are supporting it. So the second issue that I find is a bit strange is the fact that the women of France, those Muslim women, they want to exercise their hurriya, and they want to wear hijab. But the secularist country of France won't allow them. Where are those feminist women jumping up and down? Where are they at? The Palestinian women from our sisters, the Muslimat al-Mu'minat al-Ghafilat al-Salihat, inshallah, who are being hit in the face, hit in the back of their head with the butts of the machine gun pushed to the ground by these people in the occupied territory of Palestine. Where, 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 where is the kalam of the progressives? Where is the kalam? Where is the kalam? Where is the kalam? Why is it only when it's against Islam, our women, our children, us, the Quran, the Nabi of Islam, why is it that's the only time we find these people moving about? And it just goes to show that as Muslims, we got to get our heads together. We cannot be tricked and fooled by these people. They don't mean any good for us. If there is a situation where there are a bunch of girls out there protesting, then as a Muslim man, I know where my position should be. Be ghadd another what they're protesting. As a Muslim, I'm not going to allow girls to lead me in any protest. I wanted to take this opportunity because in Iran, the girls are now burning their hijabs. And it had a knock-on effect. And that girls who are Muslims across the globe are burning their hijabs. I've been in Islam since 1986. The Arab people here from Egypt and other places, they'll tell you, every so many years, we always get these kind of people who jump up and down about the hurri of the woman. Al Islam came and freed the woman when she practices Islam correctly, and when we practice Islam correctly. I will stand here and I'll say, without hesitating, our cultures many times, our adat and taqalid are oppressive. But we don't have a monopoly on that. In the West, the woman is a piece of lahm. You want to sell some shoes, a car, tires, toothbrush, just put a woman on there with no clothes on. So we're not going to get on the back foot and be defensive and apologize. We're going to say, that's something a man did. That's something the culture did, forcing his daughter to get married to someone she don't want to get married to. That's what they did, the culture. As for the deen, al-Islam gave that woman hurriya. So in regards to this issue of al-hijab, listen to what our mother Aisha said. May Allah be, be pleased with her. Put us all, wherever she is, Yomul Qiyamah, we ask Allah to put us with her. And those people who are against her, put them far, far away from her. And give us the opportunity to say to them, did you find the promise of Allah true? That he was pleased with those companions, all of them. The one who made zina, Allah is pleased with him. The one that was stoned to death, Allah is pleased with him. The one who did anything, as long as he died on Islam, Allah is pleased with them. Radiyallahu anhum wa raduan. That's our aqidah. She said, may Allah be pleased with her. Had Allah revealed one ayat telling the people, don't drink khamar, it would have never worked. The Arabs would have never stopped drinking khamar because khamar is from their way of life and it's from the desires of shahwa. People are just not going to kick it to the curb just like that. Ask anybody who drinks and gets high. That's just how it is. So the ayat had to come down to make it with a tadarruj. Al-Khamr became muharrama. Not at one time. They're not going to do it. She said, had Allah revealed one ayat telling the people, don't make zina, the kuffar of Quraysh, they're not going to listen to that. Because zina is from the hawa, the shahwa. The people are not going to stop because it was a part of who they are, who they were. So the ayat stopping people from making zina came down in the tadarruj. And that's from the hikmah of Allah and the hikmah of the tashri' of al-Islam that gave us the understanding of a hurriya that's correct.
So similar to those two issues, the issue of hijab, the hijab. Now I look in this audience, and I'm sorry to say, the vast majority of Muslims, our women don't wear hijab. So you go into any masjid, you go into any place where Muslims are there, you'll find the vast majority of our women don't wear hijab. Our wives and our daughters. That's the vast majority of the situation, the asaf. And I'm not judging anybody. If you fit that shoe and that shoe fits you, I'm not here to say you're bad and this one is good. I'm here to say that's a kabira from the kabair. And it's also a ta'an in your rojula. A man, yeah, a man may have muscles and he may out wrestle the lady and stuff like that. But the real man is the one who his wakarima is respected. And he says to his wife, don't do that, don't do this. And one of the things he can't afford is to let other men share in the mahasan of his wife. Any man can see what she's walking, working with, any man. And that doesn't mean anything to him. As a relates to the hijab, those ayat came down like that. Because Quraysh were not going to leave or just not wear a hijab just like that. It's not easy, shahwa, and the way them women were. So one of the ayahs that came down to shed light on this is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibition. وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجُ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَى You Muslim women, stay in your homes. That's the asal for the Muslim woman. My wife, your wife, my daughter, your wife. The asal is she should stay in her house. Stay in your house and don't make the display like the times of a jahiliyyah. But if she comes out to go to work, if she comes out to go to school, if she comes out for salat, she comes out for whatever, suburb is mashru. If she came out, she shouldn't come out and make the display like they did in jahiliyyah. What did they do in jahiliyyah before Islam? They did a lot. The lady would come out with perfume on. There was a companion who put perfume on and she was going to the masjid. One of the companions said, where are you going smelling like that? She said, I'm going to the masjid, feeling good. He said, I heard the prophet say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, any woman who leaves her house to go to a masjid and she's mutatayyaba, musta'atara, she has itr on her, then she's a zani. And Allah won't accept her salat until she goes and make a ghusl. Not until she wipes the perfume off, ghusl. So she has good near to come to the masjid and feel right. But if she came out in that way, it's from the times of the display of jahiliyyah. Those women used to come out, they would sit with men. They would come out, they would hang out with the men. And as a result of that, zina and things like that used to take place. So this ayah told them, don't come out like that. They would come out and have bangles on their feet making noise, bangles on their hands, making noise. They will walk in a seductive way to get the attention of men. So Islam said, one of the many ayat, don't come out like that. Don't do that. Listen to what they used to do. Allah revealed another ayat. He said in the Quran, Ya Bani Adam, khudhu zinatakum inda kulli masjidin. O son of Adam, Wear your nice clothes at every masjid. That means to wear nice clothes to Juma and for the Eid. But the reason the ayat was revealed was not about nice clothes. Abdullah ibn Abbas said in Jahiliyyah, the woman from Quraysh, the Arab, she would go around the Kaaba naked without any clothes at all. The religious one from amongst them will get a piece of paper and put it over her privates, akramakum Allah. The non-religious one would just go and walk around the Kaaba. So just imagine you're behind a woman walking around the Kaaba. She's tall, she's slim, she's short, she's heavy, and you're just looking at her and you're just walking like that. Now for that lady, what she was doing was a taqarru bil Allah. She was getting close to Allah, mutajarrida lillah. I take my clothes off for you, my Lord. That was her niya. But our religion is not based on your niya. The molid of the Nabi, I believe that those people, their niya is sincere. But wallahi, there's difference in the action. A lady being naked at the cob is big. But the one who's doing the molid with uh, my niya, 
I see no difference between the two. This is istihsan, and this is istihsan. You're just making stuff up. Now, you just imagine that lady going around the Kaaba with no clothes on, believing she's worshiping Allah. What's the difference? She's just making stuff up the same way the other people make things up. And whatever ayat you bring, and whatever hadith you bring, those ayat were revealed on Rasulullah, and those ahadith came out of his mouth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not once did he guide us to what you're understanding. You, you beat the Nabi of Islam. He hid something from us that we should be knowing. Anyway, as it relates to these women, that's what they used to do in the times of al-jahiliyyah. The times of jahiliyyah, that lady was doing crazy things. So the ayat came down telling them, don't do that. So look what happened. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. He is responsible by Allah's permission for a lot of things in our religion. A lot. He's responsible for making the two rakats behind the maqam of Ibrahim. When they were, the Prophet was asking, what should we do with the asara of Badr? Allah supported what Umar said. A lot of things. One of the things that Umar is responsible for is the hijab. He used to tell the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Tell your women to dress. Tell your women don't come out unless they're covered all together. Because you know we have these people, kuffar, munafiqeen, ya Rasulullah, tell them to dress. But Prophet Muhammad, he's a type of person who used to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although he had ghayra, he had jealousy for his woman, and he was a person who loved the tahara and khair, he knew if he did that, it may become wajib upon everybody. So he's not mustajil. He's looking at the situation, and he didn't do it right away. And then one time, Umar saw one of the wives of the Prophet Wasallam. He saw her out there, Soda bintu Zam'a. He said, at nighttime, Soda, I recognize you. I know who you are. Be careful about how you come outside. He was given a nasiha, given a dawah. She got mad. She went to the Prophet Wasallam to complain. And Allah revealed those more ayat, more ayat. He said in the Quran, Ya ayyuha nabi, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'i al-mu'mineen yudnina alayhinna min jilabibihinna thalika adna thalika adna an yu'rafna fala yu'zain. Oh nabi, tell your wives, tell your daughters, and tell the believing women who's connected to every man here. Tell them to take their clothes and to pull them over themselves. Take their clothes and to cover up themselves. Take their jilbabs and to cover everything over themselves. That was one of the many ayat. One of the many ayat. Not just one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. Eight ayat of the Quran. And one way or another telling us how our women should dress. But not at one time. Those ayat came down here and here intermediately. Why? Because it's difficult for the aqli of Benny Adam. When he wasn't want to do something, he ain't going to do it. So they've been reminded, wear these clothes, wear these clothes. Some more time went by. Some more went time went by. Allah revealed more ayat telling the Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, for the Muslim women, not to go outside in a way that is inappropriate. And from this issue, and this is critical, and that is, when it comes to the ibadat of al-Islam, it's not left to us to do it the way we want to do it. Like this khutbah al-Juma. We can't do it the way we want to do it. Maybe someone comes up with a bright idea, says, let's pray the salat first, and whoever wants to leave, let them leave, and then we'll make the khutbah, whoever wants to stay, can stay. We can't do that. You can't pray Salat al-Dhuhr on Friday when there is a khutbah al Juma. Can't do that. Some people have to go to, go, to, go to work early. So instead of praying Fajr at the time, why don't we just do Fajr at 3.30, 4 o'clock, make it easy for the people who really have the early bird jobs. No. Everything in Islam has to be done a particular way, and in doing it that particular way, there's always ways of modifying, always ways of doing it if it's difficult for you. So the issue with the hijab is, how do we wear the hijab? What does it look like? 
Is that hijab of the Muslim woman the way, okay, many Muslim women not wearing hijab? But those who do wear it, is it the lady having tight jeans on? She has tight jeans on, a jacket, and still you can see everything that she has to offer. Is that the hijab? The imam's wife doesn't wear hijab. The mudarrisa in the madrasa doesn't wear the hijab. His wife doesn't wear the hijab. So every now Muslim woman who's looking at us and our community, she doesn't know hijab. She doesn't know our religion. I'm not putting anybody down, Ya Abdullah. If the shoe fits, wear it, but I'm not putting you down. I'm not putting you down. But the question is, where is the rojula? What, what happened to the manhood of Islam? Is there any, anyone sitting in this masjid really in doubt as to what the condition is of our ummah? Any doubt about that? So how is that hijab? Let me first tell you how it's not. Prophet Muhammad prophesies this time right now about our women in many ways. And about the hijab, he said that there are two people, two groups of people from the hellfire. I haven't seen them yet, he said, because they were not present during his time. Two categories. They're from the people of the hellfire. I haven't seen them yet. One group, he said, Nisa'un kasiyatun ariyat. Ma'ilat mumilat. Ru'usuhunna ka asnamat al bakht al ma'ila. La yatkhulna al janna. Walen yajid rihaha. One group of women, listen to this hadith, is that woman who is dressed. Those women, they're dressed, they got clothes on, but they are naked. They're naked because everything is showing, the jeans and everything. And what she's wearing, the jeans are high as well. Everything you can see. He said, they have clothes on, but they are naked. They are ma'ilat mamilat. Ma'ilat, some scholars say, the way they walk is seductive. All you have to do is look at TikTok. You will see on TikTok what the aqla you saddaq on TikTok. The girl with hijab and dancing, doing all kind of dances. Anybody can just look at her. Kind of hijab, and she has hijab on. But she ties something around her and she's dancing. She leans and she walks in a seductive way. And she encourages others. Another interpretation is she leans towards men. And she calls men to lean towards her. He said on their heads, it's like the hump of a camel. The way they put their khimar on, if they have a khimar. And they just try to seduce men. That is not the hijab of al-Islam. I'm going to tell you the hijab of al-Islam. Part of the hijab of al-Islam. Our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a sister-in-law. Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with all of them. And she had on some clothes that were not appropriate in the house of her sister, Aisha. But now that Rasulullah is the husband of her sister, she can't appear like that. She can't appear. She has to put proper hijab on. Can't be like that with your cousin. Can't be like that. You and your, you're the ideal of another man, and both of you married to two sisters. Your wife can't be mutasahila with her hijab in front of that man. Although your brother-in-law, although your cousins, you can't do that. When the Prophet saw her situation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Asma, إِذَا بَلَقَتَ الْمَرْأَ الْمَحِيدِ فَلَا يَنْبَغِي أَنْ يُرَى مِنْهَا إِلَّا هَذَا وَهَذِهِ If a woman reaches the age of puberty, she starts to develop as a girl, 13, 14, not 18, not 18 years old. She's 13. She may be 12. She got a period, akramakum Allah. She's developing. He said, not Abu Usama didn't say this. Rasulullah said that. Our Nabi. If the woman reaches the age of puberty, where she gets her periods, or she starts to develop, he said nothing should be seen of that girl except her face and her hands. And that's it. One ayat that was revealed, That's what Allah said. Don't let those ladies show anything of their beauty except what has to come out. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he has an opinion. He said what must appear is her one eye because she has niqab on. That was his opinion. 
The other companion said, what must appear is her face and her hands. So I came here today, brothers in El Islam, not to put anybody down. I'm not putting anybody down. And when I say the vast majority of women not marry hijab, wallahi, I don't mean you to put you down. I don't mean you because the man who his wife or his daughters are wearing hijab, anyone from amongst us, as long as you're alive, you're not saved from a fitna. Your wife is wearing hijab today, she becomes Asiya tomorrow. Your daughter becomes Asiya tomorrow. La Sama Allah. That's what we're living with. I know religious practicing people, their daughters are not wearing hijab anymore. You would have never thought it from that man's family and his daughter. Everybody, hey, as long as you're alive, fitna can hate you. I'm going to get up here and point my finger. But I will say, what kind of man are you? What kind of man are you that you married the girl and you were shy and afraid to say to your wife, hey, I'm jealous about you. I don't want a Yehudi. I don't want a Mushrik. I don't want a Kafir. I don't want any man, even if he's a Muslim, looking at your Mahasin, knowing what you have. Who does that in his right mind? Billahi alaykum. As'alakum billah. Who does that? The man marries your daughter. He marries your daughter. The guy you give your daughter to. And you know that he himself is weak. It's your responsibility to say, hey man, I really like you. Have a nice job, nice akhlaq, nice family, stuff like that. But your mother and your sisters don't wear hijab. What are you going to do about my daughter? Are they going to give her a hard time because she wears hijab and say that she's backwards, she's mutshaddida and this and that and that? Nah, I'm not going to let you marry my daughter because I'm responsible for holding on to and protecting her deen. How do I marry my daughter to a man like that? Does that mean he's in a hellfire? Does that mean I don't like him? Does that mean we don't give him sana? No! But that's your daughter, ya akhi. So we have this fine line here today, and I'm not apologizing. The fine line of, I don't want to stand up here and sound as if I'm judging you or putting you down. Because I'm not doing that. Ha Allah. Who am I to do that? But I will say as your brother, what kind of man are you? What kind of man are you? Well, your wife, you can't tell her. Here's a hadith. Nothing should be seen of the girl. Her ears, her earrings, her hair, none of that should be seen. Except her hands and her face. Not her feet, without socks, none of that stuff. None of that stuff. Just her hands and face. Unless she's the kawaid min and nisa. If she's one of those old ladies, 75, 85, 90, she doesn't have to wear hijab because she's not trying to get married. So our young daughters and wives are trying to compete with them. Are you an old lady? And then if we ask, oh, you 45, you 40, she get mad that you say she's old. Well, you're dressing like the lady who's 75, 80. She's allowed not to dress like that. So before I sit down, I want to repeat this very clearly. Ya Abdullah, ya Akhi, you're my brother in Islam, and you probably are better than me. Allah knows best. But I'm in a race with you. I'm going to say to you as your brother, our taqalid and our adat are a problem. It's the Hindu woman who wears the sari like that, and her belly is out. Her belly is out. Well, lie, I tell you no lie. I tell you no lie. I was with a community, and it was potluck, they call it. Everybody bring a plate. Everybody bring a plate. We were going up and down, getting with the plate, getting with the plate. You just take your plate. And then one of the brothers, one of the brothers was sitting there, and the lady came by, and she was the doctor, and the wife of another doctor in her sari, her sari, what the Hindus and the Sikhs were. You know what she asked her brother? Because he was an Arab from Algeria. That's all it was. His food, she said. Not to anybody else's food. Is this food, is this meat halal? Just to put him down. Just to put him down. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yafta alayhi. Her belly was open. Her belly was out. He said, is that, is that meat halal? Is that meat that you have showing halal for me to see and everybody else to see? Wallahi, he told the truth. The lady is worrying about how the, the biha was, but she doesn't give any care in the world that her stomach is out. And her husband cared not about that. So brothers in Islam, we have to get a grip on this issue. If you're married to a woman, the hadith said, the man who is a dayuth will not enter into the jannah. 
They said, who's the dayuth, ya Rasulullah? He said that the dayuth is the man who doesn't care. His women, what they do. When they come, when they come back, where they go, where they don't go, how they talk. How, that's the dayuth. He's quiet about everything. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a zalim, a darab. You take the other extreme and you punch her in the face all the time. You beating her up and you choking her and kicking her and calling her out of her name. Doesn't mean that. It's being in the balance. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَنَسَرَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى تَوْفِيقُ وَالسَّدَاد الحمد لله حمد كثير وطيب مبارك في إخواني I don't want to sound apologetic but I just don't want to be misunderstood by you go back and talk to your wife my sister my niece go back and school her to the seriousness of the issue Last thing I want to mention is Jibril wanted to come to the Prophet وسلم, to tell him things. But when he would come to Rasulullah's house, if he found Aisha not in her hijab, he wouldn't come in. He would call the Nabi from the door. Yunadihi min indil bab. Come on, Muhammad, come over. Out of respect that she didn't have hijab on. He's an angel. Our mother Aisha, when Rasulullah died in her house, he was buried right there in her house. Wherever prophets and messengers die, that's where they're buried. Whenever she would go in there to visit him in his grave, he was dead, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She would go without any hijab and say, that's my father, that's my husband. That's my husband. He's dead. That's my husband. Her father Abu Bakr died, he was buried next to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She would go in and say, my husband and my father, my husband and my father. When Umar was about to die, he said, Aisha, would you allow me to be buried there? He, she said, I was keeping it for myself, but I'll let you. And he got buried there. When she wanted to go visit that place, she put on a hijab. And they're dead. Yeah, Akhi Abdullah, they were dead. But when she went in there and there was a man, Ajnabi Anha, Umar, she put on his hijab and she went in that place. The way we are today, we don't see the virtue in that fiqh. We don't see, we see that as being shadid, going overboard. And no one's telling you to do things like that, but it just goes to show the high level. Lastly, Ali ibn Abi Talib asked Fatima, both of them grew up in the house of Nabuwa, cousins. Fatima, what is the most beloved thing to the believing woman? What does the believing woman love the most? She thought about it and she said, the believing woman loves for her not to see men who are naha maharam, and for them not to see her. She doesn't see them and they don't see her because her father's taking care of her. Her husband's taking care of her. She doesn't have to mix with men and go to work and stuff like that. But the answer, the, the question is, where did that answer come from? That answer came from the mishkat of a nabuwa. That was the turbi of the lady. And here we come. We're going to look at that and say, that's shadid. That's gulu. No, ya akhi. That's sharaf. She was nabila. That's how it was. So, Ummah to Islam, we have a lot of stidrak to do. When we get control of our women, inshallah, we'll be on the road to success. We ask Allah to make that easy for us because it's a formidable task. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make islah between us and our children and our wives and that Allah Azza wa gives us the strength and the rajul and the hikmah to make this stuff straight that has went crooked in many of our lives. Verily, he is our wali and he is qadun lara kulli dhalika. And without his assistance, then none of it is going to happen. Akim as-salat, yarhamakumullah.